I wanted to give a little bit of context to uh, what healthcare the harms piece of this puzzle is. Uh, we uh, have been involved um, the last 19 years in bringing an environmental health and sustainability framework to the healthcare sector. Um, because of the latest science that is showing us and demonstrating that uh, the social uh, and environmental factors um, that we experience in where we live and work and play are fundamental to uh, the health of our communities. Uh, our exposure to toxic chemicals, our exposure to fossil fuels, the food system that we live under all have been profound impacts on our health. And when we looked at the healthcare system, uh, we saw that they themselves represented all the same contradictions of an economy that's built on fossil fuels and toxic chemicals and industrial agriculture so that the healthcare sector is an enormous polluter. And given that it's 20% of the entire economy of the United States, it takes up enormous space. And we thought that if we're ever going to make a transition to an economy that actually supports healthy people on a healthy planet, we have to get the healthcare sector to be leaders in that transformation because they're the one sector of the economy that actually has a mission to heal. And so our work over the last almost 20 years now has been to identify environmental health issues that, that confront the healthcare sector in its own operations, its own infrastructure, and to get them to uh, work together <coughs> to transform their practices. Um, so, uh, when we started, there were almost 5,000 medical waste incinerators in the country. Um, it was the leading source of dioxin emissions in the country. And f over 4,500, more now there's, there's less than 60 incinerators in the country. And healthcare has figured out how to recycle its waste, how to reprocess its waste, how to uh, reuse things, uh, and save money in the process. When we started, mercury thermometers were the standard. Um, and the kids were being born with enough mercury in their bodies that were impacting their brain development because of all the mercury certain you know, in, the, in the environment. And the healthcare sector in the United States and Europe and now globally is completely eliminated in mercury, moving to a complete elimination. And then we similarly did stuff around healthy buildings. How do we design our infrastructure, our clinics, our hospitals that can actually promote health as opposed to sickness? How do we, how do we detox our supply chain? How do we make cancer centers without carcinogens? How do we build children's hospitals without chemicals linked to brain uh, defects, you know, and learning disabilities? So all that's been happening over the last uh, 20 years. And in the context of that, we've also looked at food. And said, when we started, there were fast food joints in over several hundred hospitals around the country. So it, it was a complete disconnect between um, clinical care and the food that was served in, in healthcare. And over the last now almost 10 years, I think, um, we've been working to transform uh, the food purchasing practices and, and consumption practices of healthcare to make them make the essential link between healthy food and healthy people. Food is medicine. And just to, as a setup to, to Lucia's presentation and others, um, food has been the place where we started to understand how. Not only can you aggregate the purchasing power of healthcare to drive the economy, to bend the economy toward health, but also it's the place where you can begin to localize the economy. Because where the most powerful resilience is uh, in food systems is actually at the local and regional level. And so it's not good enough for um, hospitals in Boston to buy organic food from California farmers who want to have uh, sustainable farmers in, in and around Boston or Cleveland or Detroit or any other place in the country that's servicing uh, those hospitals with sustainable food as well as servicing the community. So uh, the presentation you hear today is about how we've come to understand how the current food system works in terms of the way hospitals purchase it and how we've been able to start to transform it. And then what we're trying to do here is to continue to take the next several steps in transforming it. So I'll stop there. Okay. Thanks, Gary. Thanks. Can everyone hear me? Okay, great. Um, and thank you all for being here and your participation in this discussion today. I know that we have a lot of 
expertise and experience here in the room, folks that are working on food system related projects in Oakland, Richmond, and the greater Bay Area. So what we're really going to do is provide kind of an overview of what we know and our experience in the health care sector around the procurement of healthy food and the healthy food and health care program and then really <coughs> up to talk about how can we utilize that strength and build more capacity to support what's already going on here in communities. So the healthy food and health care program, as Gary said, is about 10 years old. We got our start in 2005 with the first Clean Med Conference in Oakland. And it's really about the mission of healthy food and health care is to leverage both the purchasing power and the expertise within the healthcare sector to build a healthier food system. So after about 10 years, we have over a thousand hospitals around the country that are engaged in this work in one way or another. Some are sourcing antibiotic-free meat products, some are sourcing locally grown food, some are eliminating sugar sweetened beverages. Hospitals are doing a whole wide spectrum of different activities. Um, and here in California, we have about one third of all the California hospitals are engaged in healthy food and health care. So here in California, that translates to about, about 165 hospitals uh, doing this work. Next slide. And so when we, when we say healthy food too, it's not just about um, the nutritional, traditional nutritional content of food. It's not just about the calories and the sugars and the fibers in food. We at um, Healthy Food and Healthcare, we really take an environmental nutrition approach to the work. So it's really about, if we're going to have a healthy food system, it's really about looking at all of those social, political, economic, environmental, and health factors that go into producing that apple. Um, it's also about how that was produced, where it was produced, who produced it, the processing, the packaging, the transporting, all along the food system spectrum. So it's environmental nutrition along that food system spectrum. And there you have the food system spectrum. So, um, so all of the, so we're looking at trying to think about creative interventions and support all along the way. So procurement is one thing, and obviously a very, very important thing, but it's also like how can we look at all of those different activities that happen within the food system, and what can the healthcare sector do about it? How can it intervene? Thanks. And why do we care? Because, you know, 50 to 100 years of creating a, a very mechanized, industrialized food system have come at some really, really steep and serious health and environmental costs. And I won't go through this whole list, but um, chronic diseases, for example, hundreds of millions of dollars to treat every year. And these are diabetes, obesity, you know, these are uh, uh, illnesses that uh, cross generations within families. They plague communities and they're debilitating for communities. So very, very important, antibiotic resistant, pesticide exposure. There's a whole host of um, health, societal, and environmental costs to the way we are currently producing our food and the current food system. Next slide. And so what's healthcare's role in this and what is healthcare currently doing about it? We can, we can talk about the work that healthcare does in basically kind of three categories. The first one being the purchasing power of the healthcare food sector. So every year about 12 to 14 billion dollars a year in food expenditures nationwide. So it's a huge volume and it's a lot of procurement power. And what hospitals are starting to recognize is that they can utilize that purchasing power and start, for example, demanding more sustainable food from their distributors and their food purchasing organizations. There's a lot of examples up there on the slide and Kendra is going to describe uh, in detail a program that's going on here locally, a little bit more about that procurement power. Um, next slide. Uh, another way that hospitals are doing this work is to educate and provide good models of good nutrition within their four walls. So, 
you know, patients are in a hospital on average about three or four days. Staff members at hospitals are often from the community. They work there, they eat there three, five, sometimes seven days a week. They're stuck on the campuses and they can't get out for a half hour lunch. So, you know, there's a great opportunity that exists within the facilities to educate folks about good nutrition and also to model it by serving healthy food in their facilities. Next slide. And the third way, and the one that's kind of most relevant to this group in this conversation is, and this is relatively new, how can hospitals and the healthcare sector move beyond their four walls and really affect community's food environment, how can they take that purchasing power, that health expertise, clinical advocacy, how can they bring all of that to bear on working with communities to uh, support the capacity that's already there and help build new capacity. So it's kind of in those three categories of work and there are projects and models all over the country that um, are utilizing these various strategies. Next slide. So I just want to talk a little bit, we've talked a little bit about procurement, Kendra and both Ka and Kathleen Reed from Kaiser are going to touch on some very um, on the ground procurement examples. I want to talk a little bit about uh, other opportunities for food system interventions that are fairly new. Um, there's the passage of the Affordable Care Act, which with the mandate of addressing population health and ensuring millions of people around the country um, who did not previously have health insurance or access to health care, um, there's an opportunity there. Combined with, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about community benefits. Um, if, if a nonprofit hospital wants to keep its nonprofit status, and Jean, you can, we can talk a lot more about this in discussion. Um, um, to keep their nonprofit status, they have to devote a certain percentage of their gross to community benefits. And historically, that has been, the majority of that money has been spent on charity care, on providing care for folks who didn't have access to health care or who didn't have health insurance. And with the passage of ACA, that's, that's, that landscape and that investment portfolio is changing a bit and there's more thinking about not so much all about charity care but what can we do upstream. Um, I also want to just point out the IRS in December of 2014 um, expanded and broadened their definition of what a community benefit could be which was music to the ears of many of us who work in uh, public health and environmental health. And um, in, if I could just read this, the health needs a tax exempt hospital may consider in its community health needs assessment include not only the need to address financial and other barriers to care, but also the need to prevent illness, to ensure adequate nutrition, or to address social, behavioral, and environmental factors that influence health in the community. So the door is open even wider now for greater upstream and preventative measures around uh, public and environmental health. Uh, just two other things to mention, environmental nutrition. The, this concept of environmental nutrition with all of this work in hospitals is really gaining momentum and it's gaining momentum at the federal <coughs> level. Uh, the dietary guidelines were just under review and uh, the advisory committee to those guidelines just submitted their report and it was the first time that sustainability language was included in the dietary guidelines. It hasn't been approved yet, we're all writing letters and crossing our fingers that something will happen, but that's a really big indication of um, that environmental nutrition framing, that it's not just about carbohydrates and fats and things like that, it's really about uh, the environment as well. Last thing I'll mention is institutional purchasing power. Many of the hospitals that we work with are now reaching across sectors. Um, so it's not just about what hospitals and the healthcare sector can do with its purchasing power. Now, for example, we're teaming up with organizations like the Von Sapna Works for School Food Focus um, in the K through 12 public school community. And we're also, hospitals are starting to partner with 
universities through something called Real Food Challenge. Um, so this cross-sector collaboration makes that procurement power even greater. Um, and when we go to distributors and we go to manufacturers with volumes and dollars spent, it's a whole lot more when you have K through 12 universities and hospitals all in the same room. Next slide. So what we're talking about and what we want to talk about with this group is really about building a community-based food system. And I really, I really like this slide from Michigan State University. Um, in the center is the goal, right? A, a more community-based uh, food system, as Gary said, really localizing the food economy. So the second circle is all of those different activities and pieces that make up the food system. Um, and what if we could localize more or all of those activities, distribution, processing, food production, and the more we can localize those activities, you get the effects and the benefits of that third wheel, which are basically community health, increased health outcomes, wealth, connection, and capacity. And I just want to end, uh, this is sort of for discussion as well, but these are some of the potential outcomes we could hope to expect from a more vibrant and regional food system in those four categories. So health, uh, for example, would be improved individual and community nutrition, um, also reduced obesity and diet-related disease costs. Um, Wealth, for example, increase the number of locally owned independent businesses, increased employment in all of those pieces we were just talking about, production, distribution, retail, that kind of thing. Connection, that's one of the things with this industrialized <coughs> system is we've lost that connection between our communities and our food. And so if we can localize the economy and create that community-based system, um, we can restore those connections that were there before, and also increase connections among uh, institutions. And lastly, just uh, capacity to increase the capacity of production, storage, processing, infrastructure within communities, and I think that's where uh, one of the big ways in which the anchor institutions will come into play. Um, I think I'll, I'll stop there and and so I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Kendra Klein, and she's going to give a very concrete example of some of the procurement work that's been going on here in the Bay Area. Great. Um, so thinking about healthcare's opportunity to invest in local and regional food systems, there's both the community benefits, how might community benefit dollars um, invest in uh, <laughs> Projects, and I um, just want to point out also that each of you has um, this document in front of you. And we had an intern who pulled together an assessment of uh, community food system interventions in the Bay Area. That is a very living document. I'm guessing that all of you around the table could add um, a couple, if not 10 to 15 more things to that list. Um, so thinking about what types of activities are already happening can we support them? I am charged with telling you a little bit about hospital food procurement. So here's the other avenue is take those dollars being spent on food for the hospital cafeteria and the patients and how do we direct those towards regional food systems. Um, I, it, it's some fun opportunities and some really fun challenges. Um, and some of the challenges are illustrated simply by this very 101 look at a hospital food supply chain. Um, these group purchasing organizations are ubiquitous in the healthcare sector, and hospitals, due to contract conditions, purchase uh, 80 to 90 percent of their food through a group purchasing organization, which negotiates with broadline distributors. So those are Cisco, U.S. Foods, Gordon Food Service. You see their trucks on the road, and so a great deal of food is coming through. So there's some opportunity to. Uh, work around that GPO and source directly from broadline distributors. We've had hospitals pool their purchasing power to bring new products into U.S. Foods or Cisco. 
And there's opportunity to work with existing regional distributors or perhaps uh, new food hubs. So there's actually more opportunity for perishable goods like bakery, dairy, and produce because those have remained more regionalized um, distribution systems because they're not as amenable to this great national consolidation. <coughs> so here are just some examples of companies that are being supported by some of our Bay Area hospitals on what we call the Bay Area Hospital Leadership Team. So these are hospitals um, over the past uh, seven years that have come together to really shift their purchasing. So just giving you a snapshot um, of how hospitals are connecting with smaller companies um, to service some of their needs. And then I'm going to give you just a couple slides more in depth on a particular project called the Farm Fresh Healthcare Project. So uh, you can find this how-to guide at cahealthyfoodandhealthcare.org or just healthyfoodandhealthcare.org. Um, and this is a project that was funded by Kaiser Community Benefits and is co-coordinated by Healthcare Without Harm, Physicians for Social Responsibility, and Community Alliance with Family Farmers, if they know wants to lay that down there. Um, and we set out to shift the supply stream, to pull in, um, well, to shift the existing supply stream, existing regional produce distributors, to pull in um, product from small and mid-scale local family farmers, to prioritize organic and high plan practices on those farms, integrated pest management, so reducing, um, supporting farmers who are reducing pesticide use, Source verifies so the story of the food stays intact all the way from the farm to the hospital, and then um, the hospital advertising and marketing so that patients and staff also know. Hospitals have some very strict needs for food safety. Um, some hospitals source up to 90% of their produce fresh cut, so cubed melon. Um, so meeting that need of the hospitals for certain efficiencies. And Combining hospitals' demand to leverage change. So we have these six hospitals in the Bay Area we're working with their existing produce distributors, and we've sourced so far from these 10 farms, but we're talking to um, a couple more this summer. So I have some fun slides called Try, Try Again. Um, of missteps and things we've learned along the way, but I have a short time here, so I'm just going to give you a couple success stories. Um, one is green beans. We sourced green beans from Dwelly Farms. Um, our distributor, Bay Area's Produce, actually has a processing room in-house, and so they were able to cut quarter-inch, half-inch, and two-inch cuts, bag those, label them specifically from Dwelly Farms, um, and have at the point of sale, hospitals knew that they were buying from Joy Farms, so they could pull that through the system. And another great success has been strawberries from Hope Farms. So we have the hospitals understanding that environmental health connection between pesticide use on the farm, um, exposure to farm workers and for eaters, to prioritize organic. Um, and particularly berries with a very high pesticide load. So they've committed to higher prices for the berries. Coke Farm actually increased their acreage each year to meet the hospital demand. And Coke acts as a food hub, which is really wonderful. They've got um, warehouses and a cooling facility. They bring in produce from up to 40 smaller organic farmers in the area, which is really fantastic and allowed us to reach down to the, the 10 to 60 acre farms, um, which would be too small for a distributor to stop at otherwise. So that's just a, a little peek into some hospital procurement success, um, and you can find so much more information at healthyfoodhealthcare.org, and I will turn it over to Kathleen.